Hey, how are you? I'm fine. I am so thrilled to get to speak with you, Eric. I am... Uh Course. I'm such a huge admirer of your work, but now you've got another winner on your hands here with Devotion, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. Have you seen it? You yes. Had a to... Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. I would not be speaking with you if I had not seen it. I was just mesmerized watching Devotion. I got to tell you. And you've got a hard act to follow this year because of Top Gun Maverick in terms of aviation and aerial sequencing. But what I love, is, especially with Glenn Powell involved, we get to see him in present-day supersonic fighter pilots and then going back to the Corsairs, and it really gives us a beautiful context of history, aviation yeah. history. And in that vein, what I love with what you've done with your lensing and the lighting is that you steep us in that Korean War time period in terms of the tone, the visual tone, with the light, with the lensing, as opposed to the super glossy, high-tech look of Maverick. Sure. And that does so much, Eric, because as beautiful as your work is, and the aerials, and flying over water. I mean, just stunning. At the core of it, you really bring an intimacy to the humanity of the film and of the relationship between Jesse and Tom. Mm -hmm. And your visual tonal bandwidth there is stunning. Just stunning. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Where do you even start tackling a film like this? Boy, well, you know, it starts with the director for me, always. You know, it, it starts with sitting down with the director and listening, and listening to what they what they see for their film. And, and uh, you know, J.D. Dillard is quite articulate about, uh, or certainly was, uh, you know, about, about what he wanted to capture and what was important to him. And you know, we, were, we were very fortunate on this movie to, to have a, a lot of time together. We had a, I had a, a lot of prep. Um, we were we were in kind of in the midst of COVID. We knew we were going to f make the film during COVID, and and uh, that was obviously a worry for us. Um, uh, you, know, you know, the movie had had huge ambitions, and and we were not a we were not a particularly big picture. You know, we made the movie in fifty two days. Wow. Um, which I you know I, I think we're we're very proud of. We were we were really economical in terms of how we shot it and. Uh, I mean, we weren't a, we weren't a small movie necessarily, but we were certainly by no means uh, uh, a movie of the scale uh, that that you might expect uh, of the genre, you know. Um, and, and we were well aware of the of the comparisons that we might we we might end up um, having having to manage, and and uh, you know our our kind of our focus really was was that this was a drama, you know mm -hmm. that, that was that was the. The thing from the very beginning with JD was like, look, this is a this is a movie that deserves spectacle and 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 deserves um, all all the things that go along with aerial cinematography. But 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 first and foremost, it's a drama and it's a it's a film that that uh, needs you know it has to originate from that place. And um, you know that's kind of what we that's kind of what we focused on really it was like. What are the logistical realities that we have to deal with? You know, those are the you know the big things. Uh, how do we shoot the How do we shoot the film? How do we shoot the actors in the airplanes uh, when they can't really fly in them? Um, but but really, what what was the you know the the, the bigger question was uh, what is the tone? Uh, what is the pace? And and um, and how do we immerse the audience in that time period? Kind of the way you describe it, you know, and that, and that was uh, you know most of our conversations were, were based around what does the movie feel like? You know, not what does the movie look like, but what does the movie feel like to watch, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, you definitely, what really grounds this film, and I have to say, is the intimacy that you create, such as shooting in the Browns' house. Mm -hmm. And I love the lighting and the color within the house. It's alive, it's a work the house is a work in progress with remodeling and painting and it's much like you know Jesse 
being the first black naval aviator, very much a work in progress within the historical scheme of things. But you really feel the humanity and the care because of the scope, because you take us from the small intimacy of the home into the wide open skies. Similarly, then we're on an aircraft carrier, and how you pulled this off, I don't know. Shooting in those tiny, narrow little stairwells. <laughs> uh, this whole thing is a logistical feat, as far as I'm concerned, Eric. But you find that great balance with your framing, with the lighting, and how you use the camera. And I really just applaud that because you keep us in the moment and in the hearts of Jesse and Tom throughout this film. And that's not easy to do when the tendency might be to push that drama aside and go for the spectacle. Right. So you really nailed it. But, you know, let's get into some logistics here with this, starting with Cockpit shooting. We got a lot of cockpit shooting happening here. Yeah. We do. <laughs> <laughs> In more ways than one, literally and figuratively. How did you do, because you've got authentic Corsairs there, from what it looks like. We, we did, yes. How do you even, you know, start that in terms of capturing the guys in the, the, the face frontals? In the cockpit. Well, you know, we we had we, we had a couple problems that that we uh, well I should say challenges. They're never really problems. You know, it's like everything is a problem. But um, <laughs> you know, we yeah we had some challenges. You, you know, we we what what most people do. You know, and and I sh I shouldn't say most people because it's not like there's oodles of uh, aerial combat movies out there. But but what has been done in the past. It, it, when when filmmakers are confronted with this problem, is they is they get a they get a, a a suitable duplicate aircraft that has two seats because of course the Corsair is a single seater, mm -hmm. um, as is the Bearcat, as are most fighter planes of the of the era. So the luxuries that that a film like Top Gun has, where you have you know you have a two seater and you can put an actor in the back seat as if they're in the front seat, you put cameras and put them up in, in real in in the air. It was not was not something that we were afforded necessarily um because the airplanes just they just don't exist so we you know we had to figure out how to do it and, and what we did have is we had a, a sea fury trainer aircraft which was a two-seater uh, which was a suitable double for the air cap but was not a suitable double for the for the corsair so the the bear cat sequence to the beginning of the film was done for real in the sea fury and the, and the actors are actually up in the air and we and we shot that first and and we felt that that was a great opportunity to kind of set the tone for what what it should look like if we were to do it for real. And that was very important to us. You know, we wanted it to uh, not feel like the actors are just in front of a blue screen, which mm -hmm. we've, of course, seen before. And we wanted the, you know, the light to move on their faces and the background to feel real. And, the, you know, um, so we looked at that aircraft and we looked at where we could put the cameras and we decided, well, this is a, this is a great benchmark for where we should put the cameras in every cockpit sequence, because we should only really put the camera where it can actually be, where mm -hmm. it could actually be if we were doing it for real. And that was sort of our first rule, you know, whenever we're shooting the actors in any of these spaces, let's only ever do it in such a way where, uh, we would be limited if we were doing it for real. So we're not going to swing a technocrane outside the cockpit. We're not going to shoot on really long lenses. We're not going to um, put ourselves in a position where we pull the front off the off of, off of a fake aircraft and put the put a, a big motion picture camera, you know, six or eight feet away from the actor and get a, a long lens glamour shot of them. We're going to be in the cockpit with them for real. And that was that was sort of our focus. And then you know then it came down to okay, what do we do with all the page count that we had? <laughs> Uh, in the Corsair, you know, and I had done quite a bit of LED video wall work um, leading up to this. I'd done some car commercials. I'd done a lot of driving work with David Fincher on Mank and on, on Mindhunter. Um, and I thought it would be a great, uh, a great tool for us. And, and so we sat down with the producers, J.D. and I, 
Um, and we said, this is what we want to do. Uh, and they saw the price tag and they were, they were <laughs> concerned. Um, and we showed them some tests and we talked about the, you know, the benefits of the active reflections and how we could do this on in camera and how we could, um, put the actors in the real environment and they, and we'd be able to see it in real time. And, um, there was, a, they, they were slightly relieved, but they're still concerned about the time. And then we talked to the visual effects department, the visual effects department agreed. They liked the idea. And ultimately there were enough, uh, enough people that people that felt like it was a, a, a positive way to go. And that's what we did. So we, we built a, uh, a set in, in Atlanta where we had a nine meter high wall of an, an LED wall and we shot plates in, um, both along the, along the Atlantic coast of the United States and in the mountains, uh, in, uh, in Washington state where, where all the Korean footage was, was shot. Uh, and we shot plates and we, we put the actors in front of the wall on a, on a, um, what we call a buck, which is essentially, uh, a section of the aircraft, um, with the cockpit, you know, a picture accurate cockpit and, and canopy, et cetera, that was on a motion base and the motion base sat in front of the wall and then the actors sat in the motion base and, and they could, uh, they could be photographed in, in, in that environment. And it was, it was amazing. It was incredibly freeing. You know, we could put the actors at any elevation. We could bank the aircraft and uh, JD essentially had a joystick at his side and he could fly the aircraft <laughs> um, and talk to the actors through a microphone. Wow. Wow. And I have to tell you, it looks so glorious on screen that you would never think that they were not actually flying and banking in mountains or over the ocean. Uh, that's it's incredible. The look is incredible. And yeah, thank you. I'm wondering how it, in order to get to achieve this level of realism and authenticity, how important was it with your camera and your lens selection? Because I know you were using the Panavision, the Millennium, the DXL2. I think you were using, were you using the Red Komodo as well? We were. We were, yeah. We were, I think we were one of the, the first, if, we were very early adopters of the Komodo. Um, and that, that camera was really attractive to us because it, it was so small mm -hmm. um, that the pilots, the stunt pilots were, were, were uh, took one look at well we well let me back up we we gone to the pilots and so we want to mount the cameras to the airplanes and they said well I don't know man you know we're we're worried about weight we're worried about aerodynamics you know we don't want too much influence on the planes because we knew that we would be pushing the planes really hard and we brought a, a Komodo a prototype Komodo down to um, Planes of Fame which is a, um, a airplane museum in. Uh, out in you know East LA, kind of Arcadia area, um, and we showed the Komodo to to Steve Hinton, who was one of our stunt pilots and sort of the, the premier stunt pilot, uh, particularly for prop aircraft uh, in the world. And I said, "Well, we want to mount this to the plane." He said, "Oh, you want to mount that? Oh, no problem. We can put that anywhere you want." And so that was a huge relief, and that became a, an a, incredible tool for us because we were able to put it on the wings, we were able to put it on the landing gear, we we built mounts to put it on the tail, and uh, we put that camera all over that aircraft. Um, and that's how a lot of those shots were done in the, in the film. And then, you know, the DXL was just, a, 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 a you know, kind of a great obvious choice for us. You know, I had shot a lot of red and, um, the DXL sensor is, is, it's derived from a red sensor. Um, and I love Panavision lenses and I, I had gone to talk to Dan Sasaki at Panavision about building us a set of lenses that would, um, give us some of the some of the vintage kind of antique styles that mm -hmm. we were looking for, but were modern lenses, you know, and that was important to JD as he wanted, he wanted the film to feel period. Um, but, but told through kind of a modern perspective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and we had gone, you know, both JD and I are, are children of the eighties, you know, we're, you know, we grew up watching close encounters of the third kind and, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And, you know, we, <laughs> We liked the idea of telling this film kind of in in the American style of of the of, of the eighties and nineties. You know, the kind of back to the old days of 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 the American epic. You mm -hmm. know, and and so we wanted to we wanted to do it in in large format, and we wanted to do it on prime lenses, and we wanted to do it in a very traditional kind of formalist style. At least when they were in the aircraft and when they were fighting, you know, we wanted the camera to be static. We wanted the camera. Uh, to be um, 
to to be you know very structured the camera direction to be structured and that you know that all contributed to the lens choices and the and the and the camera direction method that we had decided that we would do you know and that can be can be challenging on the actors you know when you when you ask them to hit their marks and and you're relying on sort of formal framing or <laughs> structured <laughs> compositions and things like that you know um but uh i don't know i mean does, I, does that answer your question? Maybe yes. Like I rambled a little bit. No, there, but, yeah. I, I, I love getting into that, into that techie aspect and the reasons for, because I know the DXL2, that's, it's an 8K delivery, is it not? It is. It is. So, yeah, we shot you know, the, the Komodo 6K, the, the DXL is an 8K, and, and we, you know, we did a 4K finish, mm -hmm. and, um, which uh, I am very thankful for Sony to agree to do. You know, that was initially a... a, a another price tag that, 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 that was uh, a bit of a, there was a bit of sticker shock there, but we felt that it was important to, you know, for the film to, to exist in a, in a, in a 4k world from its, from its inception. So, um, we shot, we shot the, the film in an eight with an 8k, um, capture and then ultimately 4k finish, which included all the, all the VFX and everything. So, you know, that, that's great because the movie will, will live on, you know, in a, in a high resolution world, which is great for mm -hmm. the film, I think. This film deserves high resolution. There's so yeah. there is so much detail in here that you really want to see and you want to capture. But and this is why I love that you went with the with the uh, Panaspeed lenses and also I think you did the Sphero 65s that you really get that glamour old yeah. old Hollywood look or or quote unquote tint to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it just, it feels modern, but also it steeps you in that time period. It, we know at all times where we are, but it's not like watching an old episode of MASH. Right, right. It's just absolutely wonderful. Now, you know, for, there's a lot of aerial stuff happening here outside the plane where we're getting observationals. Yeah. How much of that, such as the the air battles uh, in Korea, uh -huh. um, was that actually, sh did you actually shoot that, or was that sent over to VFX? Most of it was shot. I mean, we sort of had a, we had a rule that really any time there was a, there was an aircraft in the frame that at least one of them was real, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, you know, we had four, we had four Corsairs that were real, and so... You know, for the most part, if you see four four Corsairs together in the movie, there's that's the four real real airplanes. Um, same with the Bearcats. They're they're, uh, you know, and that, and that was also important to the effects. You know, the effects felt like, look, it, it, if you give us if you give us a real airplane in the sky, we can we use that as reference. We need that. You know, it's it always looks better, obviously, but but it was also important. You know, for everyone involved, the the pilots, uh, the military, the um, you know, and really, we, we felt a tremendous pressure um, and, and responsibility to aviation and, uh, and to the Navy to make sure that the planes are represented as real as possible. And the way they behave, the way they move, is representative of how these planes actually move. And so, you know, we wanted, we wanted to photograph them as, uh, for real as much as possible. You know, obviously there are instances where there's dozens of planes taking off the carrier deck, etc. You know, that was not... Uh, you know, this, that that number of Corsairs just plain doesn't exist anymore. Right. So, so, you know, we were incredibly fortunate to have the four that we had. But, you know, so there's some some digital duplication uh, there for obvious reasons. But, um, but no, you know, we, we wanted, you know, we really wanted to shoot them for real. And, and, and we were lucky that, uh, the, that all the other filmmakers, you know, the, the producers were supportive of that idea and encouraging of it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we were, we were fortunate that we had Kevin LaRosa, aerial coordinator and Mike Fitzmaurice, the aerial uh, director of photography, who um, who were, you know, um, amazing in, in what they were able to capture. The aircraft carrier is something very important, but this whole thing, I love the authenticity that you stuck to. I love the fact that we've got Corsairs that you're actually filming. There's at least a real plane in each one, which then lets your VFX, they can do their own digi doubles. Yeah. Uh, to bulk it up, but what did you get to actually use an aircraft carrier? 
<laughs> no, I'm glad you asked me that because that probably means you you bought it. You bought into it. Um, I did, and I've been on an aircraft carrier, so yeah. We there there are a couple um, there are a couple aircraft carriers of of that type still in existence. There's there's one in Jacksonville and there's one in in Charleston, South Carolina, and both of them are floating museums. And we went to go look at them, um, and and both of those, uh, I believe, the Intrepid in New York is also. Uh, the correct, um, the correct aircraft. You know, forgive me, I don't remember the type, but um, but all three of those are, are the correct series, and uh, but they're all they're all flown in museums at the, time, at the moment, and, and and you know, if you've ever been on an aircraft carrier, you know how big they are, mm-hmm. just, and, and quite frankly, how high they are. Uh, and, and we went to go look at them, and and the Navy was. Um, was supportive of, uh, you know, they, they, they were, they were quite open to the idea of, of, of giving us access to, the, to these, to these ships. But, um, you know, the thing is, is they all had airplanes of various periods on them and they're all in various states of, of museum. Um, and, and it, it became very clear very quickly that, that shooting on them was, would be logistically challenging and not particularly beneficial in terms of what we read this, the types of, storytelling that we needed to describe so for example you know we knew that it was important to see the airplanes move around on the deck Mm -hmm. and take off and land we had weather sequences that were important you know for example the 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 mooring crash where he dies uh you know on his approach that it had to be raining and, and we wanted to be able you know we needed to be able to control some of the weather we wanted to be able to control where the where the ship was and and so um uh, we it, it became very clear that that we had to build the, build the aircraft carrier, and then of course the question was how and where, and <laughs> what do we do, and um, you know, and, and we were not a big movie, and 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 uh, what's you know what's the most cost effective way to to, to approach this, and um, and and there and there be what what resulted was a search for an airfield all over the country. Oh and wow! Where can we find a private airfield? Um, you know, I was naive. I thought, well, why can't we just get a parking lot? And then it was made. You know, it was. I was informed. Well, we have to get the airplanes there, which means we need a runway. And uh, you know, which which is obvious. But I, I not being a, um, an aviation nut, I of course didn't put the two and two together. So so that there in by itself necessitated a runway. Um, and and if we were going to be taking off and landing. From the set, the, the pilots wanted a second runway for security. So, for example, if a piece of debris moved on the runway or, or they were up in the air and a, and a heavy machine got stuck on the runway and they couldn't land, but they had a place to land. Mm-hmm. You know, So we, that meant we had to look for uh, an airport that had two runways that we could close, that we could, that we could you know, sort of take over for a few months. Um, and we found, we found such an airport you know, sort of between Atlanta and Savannah, Georgia, and we built the aircraft carrier on one of the runways. And, wow. and then Bruce Franklin, the, the line producer, called me up one day and he said, listen, you have to decide where you want to put this thing. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you get to decide, you know, based on the sun. We'll, you, we can put it anywhere because we know we're going to replace the background. Uh, and then became this, like, you know, 48-hour period where I sweated over where to put the <laughs> where to put the. <laughs> The carrier, and I start, you know, we modeled it in 3D and looked at the sun position and thought about it. And, you know, I had two options. I could put it on the north side of the, there, we had two runways, and I could choose either. And one was diagonal, kind of northeast to southwest, and the other was east to west. And, and I could put it on the north side or the south side. And if it was on the north side, it meant any time we were looking at it, of course, it meant it was front lit. If it was on the south side, any time we were looking at it, it meant it was generally back lit. Mm-hmm. But, of course, it would shadow the runway. And ultimately, we decided it's probably better for it to be on the north side so there's always consistent sun on on the runway and then i'm not battling the you know the continuity of the of the shadow of the of the carrier tower oh my god on the deck you know um and so so that we you know we made that decision and and um and then uh, jd and uh, brett robinson the, the first ad and i sat down and we spent a lot of time mapping out the sequences, you know, and figuring out where we had to shoot on the carrier deck and where all the planes had to be, because none of this stuff moves quickly. We made lots of maps about where, where the airplanes would be and given scenes and how we would arrange things and where the sun was going to be at what time. And then, it, you know, we'd have to shoot these certain shots at this time and then the sun would move and we'd have to shoot these shots 
when the sun was over there, et cetera. And, you know, it was a, it was a real puzzle. Now, did you, we all worked together on it. Did you have to worry about, in the placement of your aircraft carrier, did you have to worry about wind position or wind Absolutely. shear as well? I would think so because of that affects takeoff and landing. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, they. What I what I also learned, and I learned a lot about aviation on this movie. But but what I learned is runways are are generally built with the prevailing wind in in their favor. So uh, you know, at any given location. So they, um, you know, kind of the primary runway at this airport was was built sort of nor uh, east west, slightly facing uh, northeast. So it the prevailing wind generally uh, blew from the west which meant that they would take off towards the west and uh, and that was that that well, that worked to our benefit because they carriers when they're operational and, and the and the airplanes are taking off they point into the wind uh, so that was another argument to put put the tower on the on the on the north side of the runway actually but, but yeah you know I mean we had weather considerations you know there you always have weather considerations when you're making a movie but but the added thing of well, we can't fly today because it's too foggy or it's too windy or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, is another factor we had to take into consideration um, when, we were, when we were shooting, you know. Oh, my God. The, you know, and these are things that a typical, you know, director of photography, cinematographer, doesn't, with a, a, just a straight old drama, you don't have to worry about that for the most part. But yeah. You, get, you should get hazard pay for doing something like this, Eric. <laughs> uh, you know, all the other factors that, that come into play. But, of course, then you have to recreate 1950s can and the glamour of Elizabeth Taylor in casinos. Yeah. Which that entire segment is so much fun and to actually see the glitz, it's light, it's bright inside the casino. I love the lighting, the golden, uh, you know, the golden sun-kissed tinge uh, of glitter, much as sure. the exterior when we saw them walking uh, along, the, uh, along the beach, along the ocean, and it kind of that brightness and lightness, you brought that inside in the casino as well. And so elegantly shot elegant is the word for the casino how you lit it and how you shot it just beautiful no oh, thank you thank you was that a challenge to recreate 1950s can it sure was i mean if you know i uh, i've been to can and can is very specific and unique and and very european obviously and um Finding anything that even remotely resembled it in the United States uh, was terrifying. And, um, you know, Wynn Thomas, the production designer, uh, and, and I, and, and JD, and everybody, you know, we all agonized over it, honestly. We were all, we were all nervous. And we found a street, a sort of um, riverfront street in, in Savannah that, that Wynn was confident that he could, he could transform. And... Um, you know, we we were very limited in terms of our shot selection and in terms of what we felt could work and uh, and what would um, uh, what would what would sell. Um, given the fact that we couldn't go uh, to Cannes, and, and to be honest with you, um, you know, modern to Cannes looks so different from 1950s Cannes anyway. Yeah. In, in a way, it probably wouldn't have been um, that beneficial for us to go there. Uh, um, but you know, it was something we considered, but it just it just wasn't uh, a reality. So we, you know, we um, we did our best, and and uh, you know, JD JD is great like that. You know, he's really objective in terms of his ability to look at a situation, and 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 you know, he doesn't get precious about things that he's that he's aware don't work which is a, a real skill i think for a director you mm -hmm. know to to kind of uh, be able to be objective around uh what's going to what's going to work what's not listen to the to his collaborators around him uh and make an assessment and, and you know and that's what we did and we you know we found the street and we dressed it and and um you know we we, we confabbed with the vfx team about what 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 we thought we could pull off in terms of set extension, et cetera. And, um, and, and, you know, what resulted is what you see, obviously, but, you know, we, we wanted that sequence 
to look a little different uh, than the rest of the film, you know, and, and particularly, you know, that, um, that the French Riviera, you know, at least every time I've been there is, is so bright and warm and colorful mm -hmm. and, um, and, and kind of crisp, you know, and the rest of the movie has a real olive drab khaki feel to yep. it, you know, I think, um, which was something we felt that we wanted to the, the audience to really feel uh, without without feeling too graded, without feeling too oppressively pushed. But um, you know, every time we were on a on a on a military base or on a carrier or whatever, you really felt those colors, you know. Um, and then when when they got to Cannes and they got a little bit of shore leave, we thought it was a good opportunity to open the movie up and 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 bring some color into it and 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 change the tone uh, so that so that the audience was along with these guys while they were on shore and having fun, you know? Well, in that whole sequence, it also, it that's the connective tissue between Jesse and his wife back home as well, because there's color and warmth in the brown home, and there's sun and color popping here. So yeah. I, I love that metaphoric uh, connective tissue that we have uh, between with that sequence, tying it back to Jesse and his and his home and his family. It worked really, really well. You know, how logistically were you using Dolly for this film, steady cams? How were you shooting? Because we go, we're on on the carrier and we're in the war room or the situation room. You're going up and down those narrow little stairwells. You've got the sleeping quarters that God only knows, did you build the lighting into those sets? Because uh, there's nowhere you could put lighting rigs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we did. We built the, the interior of the carrier was, was a stage build. Uh, we went and looked at some carriers, and, and I had shot on um, on Navy Navy vessels before. Uh, and, and I can tell you it is, it is tedious, mm -hmm. you know, even rolling a dolly down a hallway, you know, the, 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 the portholes, the, the, the doors on a ship are all, you know, they have raised thresholds to protect against flooding. So, you know, you can't roll anything down a hallway it's to go up, you know, every six feet you go over a threshold that's 10 inches high and, and, and just getting through them quickly is, um, can, can be, you know, it can take a half hour to move the dolly, you know, 50, 60 feet. So, um, you know, we, we considered it, but it just didn't seem realistic. And, and so we built those, those sets and yes, we, you know, the, the aim was really to do as much of it built in as possible, but also to make sure that it was as real as possible. So the, so that, you know, the fixtures, these incandescent things that are over the lamps that are over the, the bunks and the fluorescents that are over the bunks and all that stuff was, uh, were, were, uh, were pulled from reference imagery of, of what the interior of the ship really looked like. And then we just accented it as needed with, with things off camera, but you know, small, small units, fluorescent tubes and um, LEDs, and, you know, as little as possible um, to be honest. And, you know, we, we, we knew we wanted to tell the story on the dolly, you know, we wanted, it was, you know, kind of back to that, that the films of our childhood. So that, you know, there's, the camera was, was on the dolly for the most part, and, uh, except for kind of the really intimate scenes. You know, the, the scenes in the in the house, for example, were all shot handheld. Mm -hmm. And and you know, Jesse uh, JD felt like Jesse's life and, and his home life needed to be different from the the rigid kind of form formality of the um, of the military part of his life. And you know, Jesse is is someone who is very disciplined and, and and focused on 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 doing his best so it was important that the camera you know reflected that in his workspace but then in his home space he's soft and and gentle and sweet with his family and, and we thought that the handheld was a good a good uh, way to, to accent that yeah there's a, gr a beautiful fluidity with the camera work in Jesse's home a really nice fluidity of, you know, you've got a little kid running around, doing whatever, but it is, it's very laid back and a uh, total opposite of the stringent military life. And it's interesting to note that even in the, in the scenes in Jesse's home, maybe not the first meeting, but 
a subsequent one, when Glenn shows up there, uh, his character of Tom shows up there, even his hair is a little less brill creamed um, <laughs> when he's at Jesse's. And I thought yeah. that was really interesting. It's like the whole vibe of that house. There was a relaxed fluidity to it, and that really comes across with your camera work there. Just really nicely well done and a perfect contrast to the military precision. I have to ask about the climactic third act scene in the snow in in Korea. Sure. Um, because that is, that's, you know, all the money is right there. The yeah. emotional money is right there. And you're dealing with night. You've got so many elements that you're working with there. Walk me through that, how you approach that scene. Well, you know, when a cinematographer reads Dusk in a script, there's um, there's always a bit of panic that sets in, <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> you know, and uh, especially on a movie that doesn't have a, a luxurious schedule and... Um, you know, I, I, it was one of the first conversations we had in one of the first meetings was how, you know, how important is this to you? Um, you know, trying to be a, uh, a practical thinker, you know, which is always the balance between, you know, a cinematographer, at least my own, in my own practice, I always feel like I am uh, constantly balancing the, the role of, of, um, of practicality and, and, and creativity, um, you know, in terms of serving the film in the best way. And, and JD said, it's of utmost importance. You know, the audience has to feel the, the, the movement of time here. We need to understand that the, the pressures of the setting sun, the fact that the helicopter has limitations, the, the fact that the Chinese are closing in on this position, uh, all of it is, is ostensibly based around the, the movement of time. And I said, okay, great, let's figure it out. And so we, you know, we, we set up, set up out to, to work from the, the crash, you know, Jesse's crash with all the guys in the air forward as, as being one continuous period of, 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 um, of, of dusk. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we it, there's a thing, sort of as a side note. You know, there's a thing I think that that a lot of modern movies suffer from, um, and that's that's the disorientation of the audience in these sorts of sequences, particularly when you have a lot of moving pieces and you have actors in vehicles, and you know, I and I think it's it's a bit of a lost art, the kind of art of screen direction, making sure that the audience is very aware of where everybody is in relationship to each other, and so they can really understand what's going on in the scene and and that was something that was very important to us and we spent a lot of time thinking about is where are all these people in real in 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 real space and let's make sure that we describe it accurately to the audience so the audience can follow along to you know marty good is behind this guy and and, and uh you know savoli is in front and he's at a lower elevation than this guy and they're you know they're when they're doing the circling and all of that all the kind of chatter that's happening after jesse crashes Leading up to Tom's decision to to take his plane down as well, was was it was important for the audience to understand that, uh, you know, we felt, and and so we we storyboarded, you know, we mm -hmm. storyboarded everything, and, and that was great because we were able to then take those storyboards and talk about well, what time do all these shots need to be shot, and you know the LED wall is helpful because the LED wall you, you can freeze time. Um, like you can on stage, so we could say, okay, it's, it's dusk. You know, six p.m. looks like this, for example. You know, the location work was substantially more difficult because uh, it it really had to be shot at dusk for the most part. <laughs> um, you know, certainly the wide stuff, and there's that shot we do where we, you know, the we take the plane, we Glenn's plane all the way down, and when the camera crashes with the aircraft, and then it becomes a handheld shot, we take him all the way over to Jesse. You know, that was where we felt, that was sort of the first moment where we felt that we had to establish time of day on location in right. terms of when we were shooting it, you know. So that was our the, our first 
you know, the, the sh- in terms of that sequence of the film, that was the thing we spent most of the time scheduling was making sure that we could shoot that at the correct time. And we had done, we probably rehearsed it all afternoon. And then, you know, with Glenn and, and it was a, you know, it's a series of visual effects takeovers. So, you know, the final shot of which was, a, was the, the airplane on a big motion controlled track on location that, you know, that finished the crash. Um, and we rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it until it was, the, you know, the sun was sitting right between those mountains in the background. And um, and I think we did two or three takes, and the last take is the one that's in the movie when the sun is right between the two of them. And that was, you know, entirely on purpose. It was exactly where, you know, we had we had we had placed the placed the the crash plane with that in mind. And you know, thank God there was sun that day because it had been <laughs> overcast. It would have been so depressing. Um, and then the following days we, we shot the coverage and it was a kind of combination of what can we shoot, what, what shots need to be shot for real at dusk and what shots can we tan in and do with blue screen. And, and so it, you know, it was, it's a tremendous credit to the actors that they were patient enough to deal with, with me saying, okay, hold on, we have to put a big crane over you and I have to tent this whole area in and I have to put blue screen in, in the background because the, most of the days we shot that, um, it was bright and sunny and, and, and it couldn't be faked with day for night or, or what have you. It had to be kind of tinted in and, and faked digitally. So the, um, you know, it's a combination. The wider stuff when the, when the helicopter lands uh, to rescue, and you know, that was all done for dusk, dusk for dusk. And uh, you know, Glenn getting in the helicopter and taking off was done dusk for dusk. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the wider stuff there was done for real. And then the tighter stuff we we did with a little bit of digital trickery to to kind of blend it all in the same time of day. But it was. You know, it was it was a major puzzle, and it was um, it, it took a tremendous amount of time uh, in in terms of prep and planning to make sure that we knew we, uh, when we could do what. And, you know, and it's it's really JD being uh, decisive enough to say, "No, I only need these shots, and let's get these shots here." And and, and also also, you know, the actors being generous enough to allow us to to shoot one side out and not, not cross shoot because we weren't, you know, it's, it's a lot, you know, especially an emotional scene, like, like what, what Jesse is going through as he's dying there was, yeah. you know, you know, we shot it, at, I think like at noon on a, on a Tuesday, you know, and, um, with a, you know, a, a lot of grip equipment around Jonathan majors. And it's, you know, it's, it's a huge testament to his, his ability as an actor, I think. And you also got to play army and shoot an actual ground battle. We did. We did. We did. Yeah, you know, there was a discussion in the in the in the prep about how much of that we wanted to show, and and, and we decided that that it was important, you know, for the audience to see the ground battle and, and understand what was happening because it's, you know, unlike World War Two and and even World War One, um, the the Korean War is not often discussed in in American media anyway. You know, it's sort of we. We've kind of ignored it, and I think a lot of the reason is because it was quite messy. It was messy politically. It was brutal. It was very violent, um, and and it has not been covered. But and but we we felt like the audience really needed context of just how awful uh, the situation was. You know, mm-hmm. it was cold. Uh, these guys were pinned down. They were isolated, and, and we needed we needed. Uh, to see it, and and so the you know the night the night sequence in the in the movie um, felt like a good opportunity to do it, and it's short, but it was just enough you know to to do it, you know, and, the, and there were you know a number of instances in the movie where we tried to do things in one or two shots, you know, very you know kind of bigger shots, but but not a lot of cuts, and and the the night battle is one of those where we introduce the audience to the camp and bring, you know, bring the camera through the camp and all that. And, you know, it was another example of something that we rehearsed um, extensively and then shot at the right time. Yeah. I'm watching that scene and it was just amazing. And as you take the camera through the camp, I'm, I'm thinking of Valley Forge and George Washington. Hey, at least they had some log cabins built uh, (laughs) to huddle in. We feel the horror I have to tell you, Eric, we feel the horror of the war. That's great. In that in that sequence, and then the the travesty uh, and the loss that comes with it as we go into uh, Jesse. Yeah. And and the plane down. 
So just so well done. I, on every level, Eric, this is, you should be so proud of your work here. You are, you. you are a storyteller. There is no way around it. You are a storyteller. And you do it with light and lens and so much care and thought. Just so beautifully done. I've got one last question I've got to ask you. You do a film like, you do a film like Mank. So much of it, yeah, it's fictionalized. A lot of it is based on truth, supposedly. You do TV episodes like Raised by Wolves. But then you do a film like this that is a true story about a true American hero. Is there, does this come with a certain amount of trepidation or personal expectation of responsibility to tell a story like this? Oh, yeah, a tremendous amount. I, you know, it's, and, uh, you know, I, I felt a similar responsibility, actually, when we did May, mm -hmm. um, just just from the, uh, my, my relationship and, 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 and the cinema uh, community's relationship with Citizen Kane. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, when we went, went out to make this film that, you know, the responsibility was, you know, in, in the terms of Citizen Kane and, and, and the movie business world, you know, that's, it's all kind of make believe. And these guys really lived this. Yeah. And there are, um, veterans who are still very much alive from the Korean war. Yes. Um, you know, the, uh, we, we would go and, and, um, talk to people in the Navy, especially naval aviators, and and the story of Jesse Brown and Tom Hudner is very real to them and very important to them, um, and it's and it's taught as part of their training, and um, you know we uh, we all of us um, the actors, the producers, JD, myself, um, the crew felt a, a, an enormous responsibility to be as accurate and um, respectful to. Uh, what 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 really happened as we could um and and also uh not to be exploitive you know mm -hmm. I, I mean it's i think that it's uh you know it's easy to um to to take a story like this and 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 push it too far and and you know i think jd um jd from the beginning said no we just need to tell the story and uh, you know, the story is dramatic enough, and uh, we just you know, you need to, you know, this, the, the, the world deserves to know. And, uh, you know, and, and, and so, yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. You know, we, we, were, um, we were very concerned about that, and we spent a lot of time, you know, just what, what does the LSO on the, on the carrier deck actually do? How do they communicate with the, with the aircraft? Where, are the air, where do they park the aircraft on the deck? What's the right orientation? You know, down to the minutia of, how the how the airplanes are stored and who is responsible for moving them and but also you know the you know, little things like the uh, you know the scene where he's given the, the, the watch by the sailor you know that really happened mm -hmm. um, you know the, the Elizabeth Taylor really met the thirty two uh, you know in the casino that really happened Jesse did speak French that's really true you know all those things um, are real and and you know and they and they. And they describe what an extraordinary person he was. I think. Mm -hmm. Did you get? Have you gotten any feedback from the family members? I, I had the pleasure of meeting Tom Tom Hudner Jr. Um, he visited us on the set, and and he gave me a, a little coin with his father's insignia on it. You know, oh. um, this is very sweet, and 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 he stayed in touch, and and as I understand it, has been has been uh, very excited and supportive of the film. And I know uh, I, I didn't have the privilege of meeting the Brown family, but, but I know J.D. did and, and Jonathan Majors did and, and Glenn did. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the Brown and, and the Hudners remain, remain close, as I understand it, to this day and stay in touch and communicate. And I think that's great. And, um, you know, it's, I, I know that was incredibly important to, to J.D., was to make sure that he had the support of the families the entire time and, and that they were involved in the process of making the movie. And, and you know, um, you, you know, that was, that was uh, very, very special to him. Well, job well done, Eric. I can't wait for everybody to get to see this film when it opens tomorrow. No, oh, thank um, you so much. I want to see devotion up there in the number one slot this weekend. <laughs> 
we'll uh, keep our fingers crossed. This has been so wonderful getting to talk to you. I can't thank you enough. I hope we get to do it again in the future. I sure do, too. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Oh, Eric, thank you. And you have a great rest of your day and holiday week. I will. You, too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.